G'day everyone, I am the man called Kimo Sabi, the man with the blame from the land down under, and this is my review of Ghetto Dragon, No Good Deed, by Julius Freeman, Alan Fletcher, and Julio Falkenhagen. It was great to see this book successfully funded a second time around. Despite having a cool look and a classic street-level vigilante story, Ghetto Dragon failed to fund when it first entered the crowdfunding scene. The creator slash writer, Julius Freeman, took the campaign down and focused on building a platform, spreading the word about the book and being more visible before he tried again. I've often said the biggest impediment to getting a comic made is money. You've got enough money, you can get anything made. The biggest impediment to getting a comic funded is having enough eyes on your product. Twitter is only 3% of the population. If you're thinking of crowdfunding a book, build your platform, be visible, be seen, and be seen everywhere you can think of. Ghetto Dragon mixes Mexican pride with 70s kung fu. The Bruce Lee overtones are none too subtle. Don't misunderstand me, that's a good thing. There's been an influx of martial arts books on crowdfunding platforms lately. A trend I approve of. In an age of Marvel's one hit a quitter quote unquote battles, martial arts comics stand out as written by people who really think about fights and battle and combat. You know you've got a better chance of getting a great fight in a martial arts comic than you do in a current era Big Two book. The book starts out strong. Matt, the protagonist, is out for his evening run and comes across the masked man dragging an unconscious woman into a van. Matt jumps into the fray, breaking noses and dislocating limbs. The out of control van crashes and Matt leaps from the rear, the unconscious woman in tow. He wakes up in the hospital, covered in bruises, hailed a hero by the girl's sister. It's clear from her and Matt's body language that there is some traction there, and you immediately suspect they'll end up as an item later in the book. In the next chapter, the book is broken up into six chapters of roughly ten pages each, we meet the leader of the Los Valientes, a Latino street gang. He threatens Casper, the driver of the van who fled when Matt acted to save the girl. Casper organises an ambush for Matt, which Matt survives by beating all the gang members who attack him. That's filmed and put online, which damages the gang's credibility. In retaliation, they attack his whole family, his brother, mother, father and sister, in an effort to get him to stay out of their business. It has the opposite effect, however. Matt takes his fight underground in an attempt to protect his family. The art on this book is pretty good. As a bit shy of really good, there's something about the inking, the lines are kind of too similar in thickness, as if the artist was using the same pen for everything on the page. I've pointed out before times when an artist should be using different pen or brush thicknesses on objects and people closer to the camera, closer to what the reader is seeing, so they look more substantial and take up more of your visual space. It's an old comic artist trick. It's part of the reason why Golden Age comics have that flat, thin look. Those old school artists didn't often differentiate line thickness. They also tried to cram too much into each panel, making the work hard to read. That's not a problem here. Although there is plenty of narration, it matches the street level, personal and intimate nature of Matt's journey from Good Samaritan to street level vigilante. The fights in this book are among some of the best I've seen. The flow, the movement from panel to panel, I hesitate to say cinematic because people think the whole MCU facing off with Thanos when people say cinematic, but what I actually mean is making use of the space to create a kind of fluid feel you get from watching a well-shot, well-paced movie in a cinema. The flow from beat to beat, panel to panel, blow to blow is second to none, and creates fights that are so much fun to read. You'll be going back time and again to re-watch these fights and marvel at how it feels like you're watching it on a screen rather than a comic book page. I don't know if this is a result of Freeman's input to the art, or the purview of Alan Fletcher, or some amalgam of the two, but it is very effective. If you're writing or drawing longer, well-paced fights for the comic page, you need to read this book. The colouring has a muddy, gritty palette, applied in a painterly, textural style. It does suit the ghetto feel of Ghetto Dragon. In those long-lived places, it's impossible to keep everything sparkling clean. There is a tactile realness to the background, people and props. At the same time, it is very muted and reduces the impact of the art in places. A cleaner, more refined, and dare I say more mainstream look would have helped the art pop more, but then you lose that very real, very relatable inner city feel. As a creator, you have to make decisions on artistic style, and the way Julius Freeman has chosen does suit the world he is creating. The colouring and art both get better over the course of the book. By the time we hit chapter 6, the art is more open and less overly detailed, and the colours are flatter, cleaner, and smoother. It's not really noticeable unless you're intentionally comparing the first and last chapter. The characters are recognisable, you're never second-guessing who is in a scene and who is talking to who. Even when a character is not clearly defined by name, Julius Freeman's writing makes it clear who they are. He put together a very well-paced tale of a man pushed to the limit, a man who chooses to fight back against the people we can all agree are bad guys. They say to make your hero more heroic, make their enemies as bad as you can. The horror stories you hear of Latino and South American-based street gangs' crimes means, as far as bad guys go, you're among some of the worst. It's confronting and frightening the influence this gang has, the way they are able to reach out and affect Matt's life and the people he loves. You see why heroes wear masks, at least the ones that aren't bulletproof. Had the gang decided to take a harder line, Matt's whole family would have been dead before he even knew what happened. It makes his decision to fight back diverge from brave and foolhardy to downright prideful, and we all know that pride comes before a fall. Unable to fight them purely with violence, despite him being a superior fighter, 
capable of defeating a half a dozen opponents simultaneously, Matt begins a ghetto-level campaign of information gathering and surveillance. The methods and manner in which he does this is very clever, walking a line between ingenious and kind of sad that his resources are so limited. He sets up his phone to record a Los Valientes safe house on three sharpened pencils and some chewed gum as a tripod. He writes everything down on yellow legal pads, the same format his narration appears on on the comic page. He maxes out what little money he has on buying listening devices from the local electronics store. He wears disguises on these outings, moustaches and beards and wigs. Once he tricks the gang leader's underling to take a cigarette lighter containing a listening device, he has to then hire an escort to get it back. It shows Matt adapting to the needs of his mission. He might be an amazing fighter, but he doesn't seem to have any training in this kind of surveillance and subterfuge, and it's fun watching him figure it all out. As you'd expect, this all takes a toll on his relationship with Crystal, the sister of the girl Matt saved at the beginning of the book. As so often is the case with these sort of origin stories, from The Mask of the Phantasm to Dark Man, as Matt finds more peace with his new lady, so too does the demands of his mission grow exponentially. This is classic Peter Parker ducking out from a date to fight Doc Ock type stuff. A welcome beat for fans of the stuff, since we can't really get it in modern comics anymore. Few Zoomers think Mark's bumpy relationship with Amber in Amazon's Invincible cartoon. But it all comes to a head one night after Matt reviews the information from the listening device. It takes two days of sifting through chatter and silence, but he gets word of what he assumes is a drug shipment. He sneaks into the warehouse wearing a mask, prepared to stop the deal and strike a significant blow to Los Valientes. Things don't go the way he planned, and it turns out it's not drugs the gang is dealing. He survives the encounter and alerts the police to what's going down, leading to a number of arrests. Matt escapes and slips in through his window to his room and finds Crystal waiting for him. She accuses him of seeing someone else because of his many absences and cancellations, and he convinces her he's actually just going jogging late at night so Los Valientes gang members don't see him. She believes him until she notices he's bleeding from injuries sustained at the warehouse fight. The chapter ends and the final part of the story is a very well-written stinger that hints at the Illuminati-style occult ties the Los Valientes gang has, a worldwide crime organisation with laws and rules codified into a kind of crime bible, and complex systems where criminals use chess moves to communicate to one another through official channels. It's very clever, well thought out and provides a sneak peek at the larger world that Matt will no doubt be coming into conflict with in book two. This book is a martial arts based modern update of the street level vigilante. Matt's ethnicity doesn't come into the story in a way that's tokenistic or overbearing. It's not a selling point, and neither should it be. Where you were born and who you sleep with is never a substitute for character development. The art is solid but could benefit from a different inking style, different inking tools or even a separate inker altogether. The colours suit the ghetto feel of the whole story but give the book a distinctly indie feel. Matt is a likeable, capable character going through familiar motions of unlucky and love, but still living by arguably the six most important words in all of superhero comicdom. With great power comes great responsibility. The fights are frenetic and very well drawn, visceral and realistic. Matt feels the effects of his actions but never backs down from overwhelming odds. This is a classic story told with a current year street edge, devoid of a gender or politics, made to entertain and exhilarate like the martial arts movies they draw inspiration from. This is a great book from a great team, and I'm excited to see what they do next. The characters are recognisable. You're never second-guessing who's in a scene and who's talking to two. No, oh, f*** you. He sets up his phone to record a Los Valientes safe house on three sharpened pencils and some chewed gunners. Ah! Oh. He sets up his phone to record a Los Valientes safe house on three sharpened pencils and some chewed gunners. F***! This is a great book from a great team, and an ex- Oh, you f***! This is a great book from a great team, and I'm exceeded.